On American lakes, outboard engines roar with raw muscle, some pushing 600 horsepower, while across the Atlantic, precision machines glide through narrow canals, built so that every drop counts. Behind this split are decades of cultural rivalry, a post-war economic boom, and regulations that forced engineers on either side to redefine what power means. What drove the world's most influential outboard makers to such opposite extremes? And are we heading toward a winner or something neither side expects? Coastlines, rivers, and lakes have always shaped the way people move on water. But the split between American and European outboards is rooted in geography as much as in engineering. In the United States, the vastness of inland lakes and sprawling river systems, many expanded by post-war dam projects, created a playground for speed and distance. Wide open water called for engines that could push boats faster and farther, with little concern for tight turns or narrow channels. After World War II, as suburban families flocked to the water, the American appetite for horsepower grew. Fuel was cheap and space was never in short supply. Across the Atlantic, the story unfolded differently. Europe's waterways are a network of narrow canals, centuries-old rivers and smaller lakes, many with strict width and draft limits. Here, every meter counts. Boats must fit under low bridges and squeeze through locks designed for barges, not for speed. High fuel taxes and the rising cost of petrol after the 1970s oil crisis put a premium on efficiency. In countries like Germany and the Netherlands, canal rules often restrict both speed and engine size, making raw power less important than reliability and quiet operation. These landscapes set the ground rules for outboard design. American engineers chased bigger displacement and brute force, while their European counterparts worked within the boundaries of space, fuel, and regulation. The result is two philosophies born from the water itself, each answering a different challenge posed by geography and economics. In America, the outboard is not just a machine bolted to a transom. It is a statement. It is the promise of a weekend unleashed, the thrill of hammering the throttle and feeling the bow rise. For generations, outboards have been sold as tickets to freedom, adventure, and a little friendly competition. The marketing is bold, the horsepower numbers even bolder. Bigger is better, louder is best. At the local marina, bragging rights often come down to who planes first or leaves the longest wake. The boat is an extension of personality, confident, extroverted, and always ready for more. Across Europe, the outboard is more like a trusted companion. It is built for the long haul, for slipping quietly through morning mist on a narrow canal or crossing a choppy lake without burning a hole in your wallet. Here, fuel is not just a cost, it is a calculation. High taxes and strict rules make efficiency a necessity, not a luxury. Quiet operation is not just polite, it is required by law in many harbors. The engine is expected to blend in, not shout for attention. Owners look for seamless integration, reliability, and a sense that the machine will last as long as the boat itself, maybe longer. These differences go deeper than engineering. They reflect what people want from their time on the water. In the U.S., it is about power and presence. In Europe, it is about precision and peace of mind. The same body of water two very different dreams. Soon, the brands behind these dreams will take center stage. On a Saturday morning at a Florida marina, the sound of a Mercury V12 firing up is unmistakable, deep, throaty, and impossible to ignore. Mechanics gather around, some with coffee, others with phones out, all watching as a 7.6-liter V12 outboard 600 horsepower of American ambition idles at the dock. One mechanic, hand still stained from yesterday's oil change, grins and says, This thing doesn't purr, it growls. That is what people want. The Mercury V12 isn't just big, it is an engineering declaration. Twelve cylinders, naturally aspirated, 
No turbos or superchargers, just pure displacement, pushing out torque like a muscle car on the water. At wide open throttle, it drinks 60 to 70 gallons of fuel per hour. But nobody at this dock seems bothered. The focus is on what it delivers, instant acceleration, the ability to push a 40-foot center console past 65 miles per hour, and enough power to tow a skier or a small house if you needed to. Under the cowl, everything is oversized. The block is die-cast aluminum, built for strength but light enough to hang off a transom. Gear case steering means the entire engine stays fixed while the lower unit pivots, giving smoother handling at speed. There is a two-speed automatic transmission, unheard of in outboards until now, shifting seamlessly as the boat climbs onto plane. For owners who run hard, service access is built in. A top hatch lets you check oil and filters without pulling the boat from the water. This outboard is more than a machine. It is a response to what American boaters ask for. The thrill of power, the pride of having the most horsepower at the dock, and the freedom to go farther, faster, without compromise. In the U.S., outboards like the Mercury V12 are trophies as much as tools. They are loud, visible, and unapologetically bold. For many, that is the entire point. In a quiet Swedish design lab, a senior engineer from Volvo Penta runs a finger along the hull lines of a new prototype. He explains, Every gram of fuel counts. Every decibel matters. We are not just building an engine, we are building a system. That philosophy drove the launch of the Volvo Penta YPS in 2004, a pod propulsion system that turned the marine world on its head. Instead of bolting an outboard to the back, IPS tucks its drive units under the hull using counter-rotating, forward-facing propellers. The result is up to 30% better fuel economy and a level of maneuverability that made joystick docking a reality. For European boaters, it was more than a technical leap. It was a rethinking of how power, hull, and electronics could work together as one. The same drive for integration shows up in the Cox CX-0300 diesel outboard. Built in the UK, this 4.4-liter V8 delivers 300 horsepower but with a fuel burn up to 30% lower than its gasoline rivals. Commercial operators, patrol boats, rescue fleets, charter companies were the early adopters drawn by the promise of longer range and fewer refueling stops. The CXO 300 emissions profile meets the strictest European standards, and its service intervals stretch far beyond what most gasoline engines can offer. For many, the extra weight and higher upfront cost are a fair trade for an engine designed to run hard, day after day, year after year. But the European path has not always been smooth. In 1998, Evan Rood's Fichte direct injection outboard, developed to rival European efficiency, hit the market with huge expectations. Within months, catastrophic failures and fires forced a recall of thousands of engines. The fallout bankrupted Outboard Marine Corporation and left American engineers wary of racing too quickly toward high-tech solutions. Meanwhile, European brands continued to refine their own advanced systems, taking a slower, more cautious route to market. These stories reveal a different kind of ambition, not for the loudest or most powerful engine, but for the most precise, the most integrated, the most enduring. European innovation is measured not in raw speed, but in how seamlessly an engine becomes part of the boat and how well it stands the test of time. Brand names on the cowling tell only half the story. In the world of outboards, national identity blurs the moment you lift the hood or trace a supply chain. Take Mercury, the icon of American boating. Its smallest engines, the 2.5 to 30 horsepower range, are not built in Wisconsin. They are assembled in Japan by Tohatsu, then shipped across oceans to wear the Mercury badge. Even mid-size Mercury outboards, up to 60 horsepower, rely on Japanese components or full assemblies, despite marketing that leans heavily on American legacy. 
Dealer forums are filled with buyers surprised to find their Made in USA outboard speaking fluent Japanese under the cowl. The story runs in both directions. European brands like Selva might source electronics from the US or Japan. Volvo Penta's advanced control systems often rely on American-made sensors and chips. Some Italian outboards use powerheads from Asia, then finish assembly in Europe to qualify for local certification. It is not unusual for a single engine to have a block cast in China, a wiring harness from Turkey, and final assembly in France or the US. The global web is so dense that even industry insiders sometimes struggle to track a part's true origin. Cross-sourcing is not just about cost, it is about specialization. Japanese factories have mastered small displacement, high reliability engines. American plants excel at casting large aluminum blocks and high output gear cases. European firms often lead in digital integration and emissions hardware. As a result, the outboard on a fisherman's skiff in Minnesota and the engine powering a Dutch canal boat might share more DNA than their owners realize. Branding and reality do not always match. The badge on the engine hints at heritage. But the real story is a global handshake of factories and engineers working across borders to meet different market demands. For buyers, the rules of origin are not just a matter of pride. They shape warranty coverage, dealer support, and even what engines are allowed on certain waters. In a marketplace where the label says one thing and the parts list another, understanding this crossbred reality is the first step toward making sense of the rules that come next. 1993 saw the Lake Constance Navigation Ordinance, known as the BSO, set a new standard for outboard engines in Europe. Suddenly, most two-stroke engines, the workhorses of small boats, failed to meet strict limits for carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and nitrogen oxides. Only the latest four-stroke models like Honda's BF series could pass without major overhauls. Manufacturers responded by adapting automotive fuel injection and catalytic converters for marine use, pushing technology forward years before similar changes reached American shores. Local rules around Lake Constance quickly rippled outward. In 2003, the European Union's first Recreational Craft Directive 2003-44 EC required all new outboards sold in member states to meet harmonized emission standards. The effect was immediate. Four strokes and advanced direct injection two strokes replaced older carbureted models almost overnight. The 2013-53 EU update added even tighter controls, layering on noise and safety requirements and making compliance more expensive. In places like Germany and Austria, further water quality laws meant only the cleanest engines could be used on many lakes. While some exemptions remained, the direction was clear, adapt or disappear. Meanwhile, the United States took a different path. The EPA's marine engine rules arrived later, with Tier 1 standards in 1998 and stricter targets phased in over the following decade. Unlike Europe, the EPA allowed manufacturers to average emissions across their product lines, so high-emission carbureted two-strokes could stay on sale if offset by cleaner models. Industry lobbying led to delays and hardship waivers, keeping older designs on the market. California's CARB standards pushed some change, but nationwide buyers still found familiar engines from the 1980s on showroom floors. Industry analysts see these regulatory splits as the real drivers of innovation. European policy forced rapid investment in clean technology. In the United States, tradition lingered, with market demand guiding what sold. By the mid-2000s, four strokes dominated European sales, while American buyers only shifted after 2010. Legal choices shaped what engines could be bought, serviced, or even used on local lakes, writing the story of outboard technology into law. On a busy charter dock in Majorca, two boats return at sunset, one American and one European. The American skipper logs another day with a 250-horsepower outboard, burning through a tank before lunch 
and topping up again before heading out for an evening run. The European captain, running a diesel-powered Cox outboard, watches the fuel gauge barely move. For him, the engine is an investment, expected to last 5,000 hours or more, almost twice the lifespan of most gasoline models. Numbers tell the story. In the U.S., the average outboard sold is 90 horsepower, but it is common to see triple that on the transoms of sport boats and fishing rigs. In Europe, 25 horsepower is the norm. High fuel prices and tight waterways keep engines small, but long service intervals and reliability top the wish list. Charter logs from the Mediterranean show diesel outboards going years between major overhauls, with maintenance budgets stretched further by fewer breakdowns and less frequent oil changes. American boats, built for speed and thrill, often face higher repair bills and shorter engine lives, but parts are cheap and mechanics are easy to find. One charter captain sums it up. In Florida, you win with horsepower. Here, you win if your engine still starts after five seasons. The economics of ownership, fuel, repairs, resale, drive what people buy and how long they keep it. For some, the math is about the rush. For others, it is about the run. In the glare of the 2023 Monaco Yacht Show, the air buzzed with anticipation as Volvo Penta unveiled its electric outboard prototype. Engineers spoke of 110 to 140 kilowatts of silent thrust, lithium-ion batteries tucked beneath the deck, and a promise of three to five hours of cruising on a single charge. European journalists circled, some nodding at the seamless integration with onboard controls, others quietly skeptical about range and charging in real-world conditions. Nearby, E-Propulsion's X40 and Spirit Evo models drew attention with modular battery packs and digital displays, their stats more at home on a smartphone than a spec sheet. Months later, across the Atlantic, the 2024 Miami International Boat Show pulsed with a different energy. Mercury's Avatar 75E and 110E prototypes took the stage, boasting swappable lithium-ion batteries and smartphone connectivity. The crowd pressed closer, intrigued by the low hum and the idea of a plug-and-play future. Vision Marine's E-Motion 180E promised 180 horsepower in near silence, while Flux Marine's 100 horsepower prototype offered the thrill of planing speeds without a drop of gasoline. Reactions ranged from awe to skepticism. Some questioned the price, others the range, but few doubted that something fundamental was changing. An industry analyst watching from the sidelines posed the question no one could quite answer. When outboards run on electrons, what becomes of tradition? If the roar is replaced by a whisper, does the soul of Bowden change or does it simply find a new voice? As the show lights faded, the debate lingered unresolved, echoing through both marinas and design labs. The future for once felt truly up for grabs. Right now, electric outboard prototypes from both continents are making headlines, proof that the race for power and sustainability is far from over. As regulators push for cleaner technology, and as boaters demand both muscle and efficiency, these rival philosophies collide on the water. What we choose next won't just shape engines, it'll define how we move across the world's waterways for decades to come.